Hello folks, my name is Lucas Mann. I'm the pastor of the Spring Church, a small Southern Baptist church just about 10 miles away from here in Lawrence. And I come out here throughout the week, my friends, to preach to you the good news of Jesus Christ, to bring the gospel of salvation. And praise be to God, I actually have a friend here, Mr. John Orcutt. If you have any questions, friends, he'd be more than happy to answer your questions. Friends, we come out here firstly and chiefly because we want to honor and exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to, to live in obedience to Him. And then secondly, under that, we want to uh, seek out your well-being. We, we want you to be reconciled to God. We want you to be in a right standing with your Creator. And so we know from the Word of God, the Bible says that the only means of reconciliation is through the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so friends, we, we come out here without without pride. We come out here without self-preservation. We're here because we care for you. Friends, we care be, because, because we understand that your soul, once it is lost, it cannot be regained. And so I want to open with the exhortation that you should not lose your soul. Do not lose your soul, my friends. Don't die in your sins. Instead, be reconciled to God through His beloved Son. And the text of Scripture I would like to direct you to is the book of Romans in Romans chapter 1, verse 20. And the Apostle Paul writes these words. He says, Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. And dear friends, if I could title this anything, it would be the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God. See, friends, I want to tell you that you have a particular knowledge of God, of God. Now, it is not a saving knowledge of God. It is not a redemptive knowledge of God. My friends, you know of God and you know that He is real. You know that He is righteous. You know that He is holy. You know that when you commit sin against God that you deserve death. But friends, you surely, many of you, do not have a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, there is a sense in which God has revealed Himself to all people. Everyone knows the true God of Scripture. But still further, there is need for special revelation, for particular revelation. And that is the revelation that God has given us in Scripture. And friends, I seek to elaborate that revelation to you. I seek to make known what that revelation is. And that's the Gospel message. And all of the Scriptures, all 66 books, in a glorious chorus, sing together the praises of the Lord Jesus Christ. All 66 books of the Bible testify to the good news of Jesus. They testify that man is sinful and he is in need of rebe of, and he is in need of salvation, that he is rebellious toward God and that he will be damned, that hell is real. And the only way that a sinner can be reconciled to the Creator, the only way someone can enter into heavenly glory is through the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, is through the mediation and the intercession of Jesus Christ, through the work upon the cross that Christ performed, through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the only way. That's the special revelation that God's Word gives us. But friends, you are without excuse. Even apart from the Word, apart from God's Word, you're without excuse, friends. You know the true God. In fact, friends, I would submit to you that I'm an a-atheist. I'm an a-atheist. There's no such thing, my friends, as an atheist. There's no such thing as someone who is genuinely ignorant of God. There is no such thing as someone who is genuinely ignorant about their Creator. For the text reads, God has made it evident to them. Friends, you are without excuse. And now the context of this passage, the Apostle Paul in Romans 1 has established his thesis statement for the book, what he is going to spend the rest of the book unpa uh, unpacking, which is the Gospel message, as he says in verse 16. He says, For I am not ashamed of the Gospel. And then the next verse later in verse 17, he says, For in it, that is the Gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. 
That's really what the whole book of Romans is about. Righteousness by faith. That is, that you can be made right with God by faith in the Gospel of Jesus Christ. But he begins, he begins his exposition of the good news by first explaining the bad. As he starts in verse 18, and this is right after verse 17, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. So he begins with this railing judgment upon sinful mankind, that they are ungodly, and that they are unrighteous, and therefore God reveals His wrath from heaven. And the only safe haven, the only freedom, the only way of salvation is through the ark of salvation, and that is Christ Jesus the Lord. But I really want to turn your attention to verse 19, which is what we're looking at here. I want to turn your attention to verse 19, which speaks greatly to this truth, that no one is ignorant of their God. As it says in verse 19, flowing right out of verse 18, because that which is known about God is evident within them. The knowledge of God, my friends, is among all the peoples of the world. People all around the world have the seed of religion within them. They are meant to worship. Friends, look around you. Look at all the cultures. Look at all the traditions. There's religious worship happening all around the world. People know that they are created to worship and that is why they do so. Because it is in their inherent nature. But the problem is, is they do not worship God. They do not worship the true God of Scripture. Perhaps you do not worship the true God of Scripture. Perhaps you're worshiping an idol, my friends. Perhaps you're worshiping your money or your materialism. Friends, do not do that. Do not die in your sins. For God made it evident to them. My friends, no innocent people go to hell. That's because... No one who goes to hell was innocent. No ignorant people go to hell because everyone who goes to hell is not ignorant. Friends, people know that there is a God. They know who He is. Not just that He exists, but they know His identity. That He is the God of Scripture. He is the Creator God. And this God has revealed certain aspects of His character to the, sin, the, to the children of men. Listen to verse 20. It says, for since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Firstly, the Apostle Paul lists that God's invisible attributes, what are some of the attributes that God has revealed in nature? Well, my friends, we see firstly the wisdom of God in the creation of of all things. We see the creativity of God. We see the brilliance of God. We see the power of God. We see the omniscience of God. We see the omnipresence of God. We see the omnipotence of God. And my friends, even if we zoom in further and we look at the heart of man, we see the justice of God. For we look and we see that we all have a sense of right and wrong. We have what is called a conscience, which is Latin for with knowledge. God has placed certain knowledge within each and every one of us. We know it is wrong to lie. We know that it is wrong to steal. We know that it is wrong to murder. Cultures around the world recognize this. Why? Because it is implanted within them by the Creator. And that reflects something about God to us, my friends, and that is that He is just and righteous. God is holy. He is a just judge. He cannot look upon sin. He hates murderers. He hates the thieves. He hates the blasphemers. Friends, we ourselves understand this about the Creator. We understand this about God. But we suppress that understanding. We suppress that truth. 
and unrighteousness. Friends, we suppress that truth in unrighteousness. God is holy. And the word holy means you are, you are sanctified, you're set apart. God is set apart from all that is evil, all that is wicked. God is, is so righteous and pure. You mind if I give you one of these, sir? No, thank you. Se habla en español? I, I have one in Spanish for you if you'd like. So friends, God is separated from wickedness. He is separated from evil. And He cannot look upon it. In fact, even the most righteous and holy people in the eyes of God know and are sinful. Even the most religious cannot stand before the Holy One. My friends, God is not like we think Him to be. He is not a figment of man's imagination. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are greater than our thoughts. Dear friends, and I call you that because I care for your souls. Understand this about your Maker, that He is not how you think Him to be. He is much greater, much more holy, much more righteous than you can possibly fathom. In fact, the prophet Isaiah had a vision, had a vision of the Lord of hosts. God allowed Isaiah to, to have a vision of, of the Lord of, of glory, the Lord Jesus Christ, seated upon His throne. in heaven. And Isaiah, who was a prophet of the Most High, who was a holy, who was a righteous man, could not stand before the Lord. Listen to the words of Isaiah 6. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, Isaiah records, in the, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of His robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above Him, each having six wings. With two He covered His face, and with two He covered His feet, and with two He flew. And the one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And then listen to verse 4. And the foundations of the thresholds of the temple trembled at the voice of Him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I'm, I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King. Yahweh of hosts. God, my friends, God is, is so righteous and holy. It is true that God is gracious and He is compassionate. It is true that God, as 1 John 4, 8 tells us, is love personified. He is the definition of what love is. But none of those attributes of God negate and diminish His holiness. They never take away, they never subtract from God's righteousness. But friends, God does not only go that far, but He goes further and He explains and He expounds His holiness. He tells us objectively how He is holy in His Word, in the Ten Commandments. My friends, God has put forth, He has published His law. God has given His law to obey. But oh, how often the law is trampled underfoot by the children of men. How often is the law of the Lord rejected? My friends, how often is God's law treated lightly? How often is God's law rejected instead of being honored? Here are a few of the commandments out of Exodus 20. 
God says in verse 13, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Friends, oh, how often do we break these commands? You may say, well, that first one you read off, I surely have not broken it. I surely have not transgressed it. Friends, the Lord Jesus comes along in Matthew 5 and says, if you have hatred in your heart, if you have anger in your heart, then God sees you as a murderer and you deserve to be thrown into the fiery hell, as Matthew 5 says. What about the other one? You shall not commit adultery. Jesus said in Matthew 5, if you look at a woman, if you look at a woman with lust for her, you commit adultery in your heart. And that goes for you ladies as well. You look at a, a man with adultery, then you commit adultery, uh, excuse me, when you look at a man with lust, you commit adultery in your heart with them. My friends, God sees your web history. He sees the pornography you watch. He sees your lust. My friends, and God judges sin. That's the whole point of the law, is to show us our sin. The law was never the means to be saved by. The law was never supposed to be the way of salvation. It was to show us that Jesus Christ is the way of salvation. It was to show us that He is the Savior, and He is the only one who fulfilled the law. He's the only one who kept the law. Christ the Lord. So friends, this, this sin of adultery, we've all found ourselves committing it. See, God does not simply look at the outward performance. He looks at the mind and the heart. Friends, God sees your mind. He sees your heart and He knows you're wicked. He knows you're evil in your core. People are not inherently good. People are not inherently righteous. They are inherently evil. Depraved to the uttermost, corrupt to the core. Their souls are filthy, my friends. Don't think yourself to be inherently good. Don't think any man. Don't even think myself. I surely am the chief of sinners, the chief of transgressors, deserving eternal hellfire just as you do. I'm not saying these things as if I'm better than you. No, I'm, I'm any, if anything, I'm worse than you. But friends, I must warn you. And I must tell you about your sin. Think, if you would, for a moment about a doctor who just went around telling his patients about all the treatment options that they could undergo. But he never took the time to tell them about their illnesses. So they rejected him. They turned away his offers of treatment. And they cared nothing for what he had to say. My friends, a, a, a good doctor takes his time and explains the disease, explains the effect, explains how bad the, the patient's condition really is so, they can be so that they can be healed, so that they can be treated, that they can be saved from their illness. Friends, listen to the word of the Lord. God says in Isaiah 1, Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be as white as snow. Young man, remember the Lord in your youth. The Bible says, remember the Lord in your youth. Consider your days, my friends, both young and old, that they are but few and they will pass soon and you'll stand before God and the only way you can go to heaven it's through Jesus Christ. God says, moreover, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 15, that you shall not steal. God commands people not to be thieves. But my friends, you may say, well, listen, I don't steal now that I'm older, but did you when you were young? Did you incur that guilt when you were a child? For it still stands today. God is immutable. 
God is never changing. And He keeps account of every thoughtless word, every inconsiderate action, every evil deed that was ever committed. He takes account of it. And it is recorded in His books. And the books will be open one day. And my friends, the only way your account can be cleared is through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Sir, have you been born again? Have you been born from above? Well, let me ask you, do you bear fruit? Jesus said every tree does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. You need to be reconciled to God, friends. Reconciled to the Lord Jesus Christ. Through the Lord Jesus Christ to God. As Ephesians says, we have access to God in one spirit. Through Christ. Through Christ. Number 16, or verse 16 of Exodus 20. God says you shall not bear false witness. You shall not be a liar. Friends, this is one that we are all guilty of. Countless times in your lives have you told lies and you know it. Countless times have you warped the truth for your own benefit. Countless times have you not reported things factually. You know that you have guilt before God. You know that you have guilt before your Creator, friends. God will deal with the wicked. As the book of Revelation tells us, every liar will have their place in the lake of fire. Listen to what Revelation says. Revelation 22, 14. And in verse 15, John writes, Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates of the city. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. Hell is hot for the liars. Hell is hot for the thieves. Hell is hot for the blasphemers, friends. We're without hope. Because of our guilt, we deserve hell. Because of our guilt, do we deserve eternal damnation. Without hope. Jesus talked more about hell than He did heaven. Why? He wanted to warn sinners. He wanted to warn the lost of their impending peril. Luke 19.10 records the the words of the Lord Jesus saying, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Christ came to save sinners, among whom I am the foremost. Friends, this guilt, this guilt that we have before God must be punished. What would you think of a judge here in South Carolina who led a guilty murderer, who led a guilty pedophile, who led a a guilty rapist off the hook? We would think very little of him. Friends, we would think very little of a judge who did that. God is holy. God is just and He must punish sin. He must punish the sinner. God will not compromise His holiness. He will not compromise His character on the altar of what is supposedly dubbed grace or love. God will not. And the place of God's punishment for sin is eternal hell. It's an eternal conscience, conscious Torment. It's a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus described it as the place of, of outer darkness. Jesus described it as a place of terror. My friends, I don't want you to go to hell. I don't want you to die in your sins. Friends, don't lose your souls for your sin. Don't be thrown into the pit of hell for your sins. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Friends, the blood of the cross of Jesus Christ is able to save you. But right now, you're outside of Him. You're without hope. 
The torments of hell are so real. It's not soul sleep. It's not annihilation. There's no such thing as purgatory. It's either heaven or hell. It's either light or darkness. Jesus said this about the wicked in Matthew 5 in Matthew 25, excuse me, in verse 46. Listen to what he says. He says, These will go into, excuse me, will go away into eternal punishment. But the righteous into eternal life. Are you righteous, friends? No, you're not. You're sinners in the hands of an angry God. Sinners in the hands of the just God of glory. Friends, your guilt will damn you. Your guilt will cause you to be eternally lost in your sins. Friends, your soul is filthy in sin. You are swimming in the sewer of iniquity. Hell is real, my friends. Let the moans of the damned Fear, make you fear the Lord. Let the terror, the cries of terror, the cries of torment, the cries of agony of those who are in the lake of fire, who are perishing eternally. Let that move you to be broken over your sin, to understand the holiness of God. Fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord will surely save you. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Psalm 2.12 records these words. Do homage to the Son that He not become angry and you perish in the way, for His wrath may be soon kindled. Friends, Christ is the, the raging warrior. He's coming to, to release judgment upon the ungodly. He's coming to judge the wicked. Christ is coming. Many of you have a, a weak view of Christ. Many of you look at Him as a weak feminized teacher some weak prophet but Jesus was the Lord of glory and he's the conquering king Revelation 19 says these words in verse 11 the Apostle John says and I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he who sat on it, it is called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and wages war his eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, were white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that he may strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. Verse 16, and on his robe and on his thigh. He has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Christ is coming to render judgment upon the ungodly, my friends. Where will you be on the day of judgment? Where will you be? Judgment day is coming. Jesus said, in Revelation 22, Behold, I am coming with me, and my reward is with me, to render to each man according to what he has done. Friends, have you sowed sin? You will reap eternal damnation upon your souls. And you know this about God. For Going back to the text in Romans 1, verse 19, For that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. Friends, God has made this abundantly clear to your souls, but you suppress it in unrighteousness. You suppress it in your unrighteousness. And instead of coming for cleansing, you reject Christ. You reject the Gospel. You reject the God of Scripture. You reject the Bible as the Word of God. To your own destruction, But my friends, I want to bring to you the good news. 
And that is that in this, in this moment of hopelessness that you might be experiencing, I can say, for God so loved the world. Dear friends, it is true that we deserve hell. We are condemned there by default. Every one of you are condemned there and you're headed to destruction. But listen, be attentive to the word of the Lord. God being rich in mercy because of His great love toward His people. He sent His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He sent His Son to come and to live a perfect life. Galatians 4.4 4 says that when the fullness of the times came, God sent forth His Son. Jesus Christ has come. He has come. God has dwelt among men. God has tabernacled among us. John 1 records in verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it. Verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Christ has come. My friends, God has condescended. He has stepped down. He has taken a quantum leap. He has humbled Himself and dwelt among men. The Creator of the universe, the Creator of your souls, has come down and dwelt among the children of men. He came to teach. He came to heal. He came to preach. But chiefly, as I, as I quoted earlier, He came to save that which was lost. He came to seek out salvation for those who could never get it themselves. Every other religion in the world, man has to build his way up to God. Man has to pull himself up to God. But biblical Christianity, the true religion, it says God has condescended and has come and has dwelt among men. God has come and done for man what man could never do for himself. Because of our sin, we are tainted to the core and we can do nothing good. Isaiah 64, 6 says, We have altogether become useless. There is not one who does good, not even one, friends. So Christ Jesus, the Lord of glory, the transcendent God, comes and dwells among men. Do you know this Christ, my friends? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Maybe more importantly, I could put it, does Christ Jesus know you? Does He know you? Has He sought you out? Has He saved you from your sins, my friends? Do not die in your sins. Do not lose your soul, my friends. God sees what your girlfriend or your wife doesn't see. God sees your internet history. God sees the thoughts that go through your mind, my friends. God sees your web browsing history. You may delete. I got no you may delete it, my friends. God sees what you look at on the internet. God sees what goes through your mind, my friends. What are you going to answer? Wow, what are you going to say to the Creator on the Day of Judgment when He judges you according to His perfect law? Sir, what are you going to say? What are you going to say when God holds you accountable for the life which you live? I don't want you to go to hell. I don't want you to die in your sins. I don't want you to perish eternally. Friend, come and let us reason together. I'm willing to talk with you. So Christ Jesus comes. He is born under the law. He's born of a virgin. And He fulfills the law. Jesus comes for the express purpose of fulfilling the commands that we could not fulfill. Remember the ones we looked at. You shall not lie. You shall not steal. He comes and He fulfills those. Because we could not. So He does it on behalf of sinners. He does it on behalf of His elect people. Listen to Matthew 5, verse 17. Jesus says, 
Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. My friends, Jesus Christ came and fulfilled the law. He fulfilled God's law, something we could not accomplish. He performed perfect works on behalf of the elect. And then He went to the cross. Jesus Christ died a sinner's death. He was condemned by the hands of sinful men. And He was nailed to the cross of Calvary. He was crushed under the weight of God's wrath against sin. Friends, I want, to, I, I want you to understand the cross of Jesus Christ. Listen to the words the Apostle Paul uses in Romans 3 to describe the cross of Jesus Christ. He says, For all have sinned, verse 23, and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace, through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. Friends, I want to communicate to you the invaluable meaning, the glorious, weighty, and deep meaning of this word, propitiation. My friends, propitiation means wrath has been absorbed. Christ at the cross absorbed God's wrath against sin. This is so glorious. What is hell, my friends? What is hell? This place which I have spoken of and have talked about. What is hell, my friends? Hell is God unleashing His wrath upon sinners. Is God unleashing His wrath upon the ungodly. But what is the cross of Jesus Christ? It is God unleashing His wrath upon His Son. God spares His people and crushes His own Son. Instead of sinners having to go to hell, God crushes and damns His own Son. Isaiah 53.10 says, But it pleased the Lord to crush Him. It pleased God's wrath to, to, to slaughter His Son as a, as a lamb without blemish, without spot. Friends, is this reality the power of God unto you? Is the Gospel message precious to you? Does this truth grip your soul, my friends? The fact that Christ satisfied God's wrath against sin. Think about that. The, the infinite wrath of Almighty God was poured out upon His Son for a matter of three hours and God can spare sinners an eternity in hell because of what Jesus did at the cross. That's the message of the Gospel. That's the good news. That's the cardinal point of the Christian faith. That's the heart of it, my friends. This is the reason I come out here. That you might behold the glory of God as it is revealed in the Gospel message. That you might behold the glory of Jesus Christ as it is revealed in the Gospel message. Listen to the words of Isaiah 53, which was written 700 years before Jesus was even born. Isaiah 53, 5 says, But He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him, and by His scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to His own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on Him. He was oppressed and He was afflicted, yet He did not open His mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so He did not open His mouth. By oppression and judgment He was taken away, and as for His generation, who considered that He was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of My people to whom the stroke was due. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him. My friends, is this precious to you? Is this your all in all, the good news 
The reason it is called good news is because it truly, really is the UN Gelion. It really is the good tidings of salvation. The Apostle Paul said in Galatians 6.14, May I never boast, but in the cross of Jesus Christ. He said elsewhere in 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, He says, I have determined to know nothing among you, unless, G uh, I, excuse me, I have determined to know nothing among you, except Christ Jesus and Him crucified. Friends, this is the good news. Jesus died for sin. He died as a, as a sin sacrifice. As a, sacri a guilt offering, a sacrifice for sin. He died as the Savior. He died as the Redeemer. He died as the one who would save people from their sins. My friends, you need to be saved from your sins. You need to be redeemed. By the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood which He shed at Calvary. That's why in chapter 3 of Romans it says, Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. Christ's blood was spilled at Calvary. And not a single drop of the Savior's blood was shed in vain. No, He will save those for whom He died. He will. And we come out here, my friend John and I, trusting that God in His sovereignty will use us, use us as instruments in His hand to bring His elect to salvation, to bring His elect to saving faith in Christ. We're hoping that you are. We're praying that you are one of the elect. That every one of you would receive mercy this day. But my friends, I am happy to report to you that Jesus Christ not only died for sin, but He rose from the grave on the third day. He rose from the grave. My friends, no other man could do what Jesus Christ did. No other man could raise himself up from the grave. There is one thing that will one day grip us all if the Lord tarries in His return, and that is death. The most strong, the most robust, the most bold, the most brilliant among us, the most rich, the most powerful, will be gripped by death. My friends, one day, death's grip will come upon your life, and you will die. One day, I will die. One day, my friend John will die if the Lord chooses to remain in glory and not to come back yet. But Jesus Christ died, yes, voluntarily, and then He was raised on the third day. Jesus said in John 11.25, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus Christ is by His nature life. He is by His very nature life. He is the way and the truth and the life. And no man comes to the Father but through Him. No other religious leader could do what Jesus Christ did. Buddha could not raise himself from the dead. Joseph Smith could not raise himself from the dead. Charles Taze Russell could not raise himself from the dead. None of the popes could raise himself from the dead. Mohammed could not raise himself from the dead. No other man could do what Jesus Christ did. By His own power, by His own free will, by His own strength, He rose Himself up from the grave. Jesus is alive today. He is the true God in eternal life. And He will never die again as the book of Hebrews tells us. But He lives to make intercession for those who draw near to God through Him. Never shall He die. And not only that, but 40 days later, after further ministry among His disciples, He was exalted in glory. That is, that He went to heaven and He sat down in glory. He sat down on His throne at the right hand of the throne of majesty on high.
As it says in Acts chapter 1, verse 9, after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Christ was exalted in heaven to the right hand of God's throne. It says also in Luke chapter 24, in verse 51, it says, while he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. He's seated in heaven now. And what is the, what is the divine command? What is the divine imperative? What is it that you must do to be saved in light of the gospel? Repent and believe it. Turn from your sins, my friends. Flee your iniquities. Flee your transgressions. Flee your rebellion. Don't die in your sins. You know, as the text of Romans of chapter 1, verse 19 tells us, you know that God is real. You know who He is. God's made it evident within you. And therefore, my friends, turn to the God whom you know to be real. Jesus said in Mark 1.15, Repent and believe the gospel. He said in Luke 13.3 and in Luke 13.5, Repent. The Apostle, John, uh, Apostle Paul excuse me, testified that everyone everywhere is to repent and to have faith in God, as Acts 20 records. My friends, repentance simply means this, to change your mind, to turn from your sins, to turn from your rebellion, to turn from your iniquities, to turn from your pornography, to turn from your drunkenness, to turn from your worldliness, to turn from your selfishness. and to believe. To believe. Repentance and faith are, are two sides of the same coin. Each action is related to one another. Repentance is a change of mind, a turning from sin, and faith is trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. My friends, true repentance constitutes a fleeing from self-confidence. Your righteous works will never merit you eternal life. Your good, de good deeds will never save you, my friends. You need salvation through the finished work of Jesus Christ. And that is what faith is. Faith is a, a, a trusting, a leaning on the finished work of Christ. It is a relying upon what Christ has done to save you from your sins. I don't want you to go to hell, my friends. Turn to Jesus Christ in saving faith and He will receive you. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, I'll actually turn there, Matthew 11, verse 28, He says, Come to Me, all who are heavy, a weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take My yoke upon you and learn from Me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for My yoke is easy and My burden is light. Friends, Christ invites you the outward call of the gospel is going forth. Come to Jesus Christ and be saved from your sins. Come to Jesus Christ and be saved from hell. Don't come to Him for health. Don't come to Him for wealth. Don't come to Christ for prosperity. Don't come to Christ for power. Come to Christ because He'll save you from hell. Come to Christ to the glory of God. Bring God glory and honor because of what He has done in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus Christ, the Son, and give Him the glory, the great things that He has done. Give God the glory for the fact that He sent His Son Jesus into the world to search out sinners and to die and to be raised on the third day. And if you repent and believe the gospel, you'll be saved. But friends, I want to make a charge further to you. See, repentance and faith, in their very nature, are by default self-denying. That is, that you must forget about yourself and your own dreams, your own passions, your own desires, your own life. You must lose everything for Christ. Being saved is free. But following after Christ will cost you everything. And you must follow after Him. 
My friends, you must follow after Jesus Christ. Jesus himself says in Luke 9, he says in Luke 9, verse 23, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and, and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Friends, deny yourself. Forget about yourself. Let go of yourself. Let go of your dreams. Let go of your own lust and passions and follow after Jesus Christ. He's worthy. He's the pearl of great price. He's the Lord, our righteousness. Yahweh to sit canoe. He's the Savior, my friends, please. He's precious. He's glorious. Friends, is Christ your all? And I will give you the... Here is the promise of the Gospel. Here is the promise of eternal life in Christ. That if you repent and believe on Him, your sins will be gone. You'll be cleansed of all your sins. You will be cleansed of your guilt, young man. Cleansed of your iniquity. And you'll be given the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You'll be cleansed of all your guilt because of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you guys. And He will be given, you will be given the righteousness of Jesus Christ. God will credit you with having lived Christ's perfect life because Christ was credited with having lived your sinful life. That's the great exchange of the Gospel, friends. That's the great exchange of the good news. Christ takes my sin and I get His righteousness. My friends, is your hope built on Christ's work and not your own? Is your hope built on the work of Jesus? Or is it built on your own performance? Is it built on your own religion? Is it built on your own Bible reading? Or your own prayers? Or your own religious activities? Or is it built on the finished work of Jesus Christ? Friends, consider, inhabitants of South Carolina, consider your soul. Don't lose your soul for your sin. Repent and believe the gospel and you will be cleansed of your sin. And you'll be given righteousness. The righteousness of Christ. Think about this, my friends. God will look upon you as if you lived Jesus' perfect life. That's glorious. How splendid, how splendid is such a truth. Listen to the words of, of 2 Corinthians 5.21. It says, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Christ takes my sin and I get His righteousness. That's the promise of the Gospel. And heaven awaits you if you are in Christ. Repent and believe so that you might be received into glory. That you might be received into celestial heaven. That you might be reconciled to your Creator. If brought into a right standing with God. That you might be saved. Listen to the words of 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. He says, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God, and such we are. For this reason the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, we are the children of God, and it will not, it, it, excuse me, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him. Because we will see Him just as He is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on Him purifies himself 
just as he is pure? Is Christ your hope so that you'll be purified? My friends, if you are in Christ, you have the hope of glory that when Christ returns, you will be received into his glorious presence for all eternity. Friends, I want you to go to heaven when you die. I don't want you to go to hell. Repent and believe the gospel message. Trust in Christ. Jesus saves. He frees you from religious legalism. He frees you from religious performance. He is the Savior. He is the Lord. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Friends, I address you who are lost. Come to Christ and have life eternally. Listen to the free offer. The free offer is only here for a select time. It's only here for a limited time and soon the offer will be taken away, friends. God bless you guys. Y'all you. You have a good day. You're welcome. Listen to the words of Isaiah 55.1. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to, to the waters and you who have no money, come and buy and eat. Buy wine and milk without money and without cost. My friends, Jesus Christ is willing to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through Him. Gee, there is only one mediator between God and man, and that is the man Christ Jesus. The Bible says He is the way and the truth and the life. There is no way of salvation but through Christ the Lord. Have you been reconciled to God, friends, through the work of Jesus Christ? Have you been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ? He is the only way of salvation. And He is the loving Lord. Oh, I love the words of the hymn. Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Jesus, lover of my soul. Friends, for God so loved the world that He sent His Son. This in is the love of God. This is the display of God's grace and mercy. And I exhort you who are Christians to live on this truth and to preach it till you die to make the gospel to be more and more the center of your lives. And I want to, in closing, say, give God glory. This all works to the chief end of God's glory. This is all about the glory of God. God has condescended. God has dwelt among men. God has died on the cross. God has been raised on the third day because God is seeking to bring His name glory. God is jealous for His own glory. God is jealous for His own honor. God is jealous for His exaltation. And as the book of Isaiah says, He will not give it to another. And so friends, I cry out to you, give God the glory. Give Yahweh the glory for the great things He has done by coming to Him through Jesus Christ. Give Him the glory for who He is. Give Him the glory and honor and praise that is due unto Him as you are His creators. Uh, excuse me, you, as you are His creatures. Christ is worthy of glory. He is worthy of all honor and praise. Listen to the words of 2 Peter chapter 3. In verse 17 he says, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of undisciplined men and fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. To Christ be glory forever and ever and ever indeed. So in closing, in the conclusion, we have seen from Romans 1, we have seen that God has put forth His general revelation, His general knowledge of Himself in the hearts of all men. And they know Him to be the true God. They know Him to be real. For God has made it evident to them. And even outside of that, and furthermore, God has made it evident who He is and what He has done for sinners in His Word. 
by bringing forth the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is the author of the greatest story ever told. And it is the story of the work of Jesus Christ and His redemption of His elect people for His own glory. And it is to Him be glory. It is to Him that is that is that glory is to be brought. Yes, indeed, to Christ, the Lord of glory. Be brought glory, worship, and praise forever. Amen. Amen. Amen.